last session focused on a really important aspect of innovation and engineering biology and is related to that regulatory environment and the process to bring innovations to the marketplace. So ensuring that we can take inventions from the lab to and get them to innovations that make a difference in people's lives, both for consumers and producers. Today, we have Dr. Jordan Thompson from Ontario Associate Vice President at Ontario Genomics. And I've had the pleasure of working with Jordan uh, as part of Canada's National Engineering Biology Steering Team. And, and he's going to give us an overview of our, our roadmap and the work that, that he and uh, Bettina Hamlin from Ontario Genomics have been catalyzing from coast to coast here in Canada to bring Canada's engineering biology programs, ensure connectivity, interoperability between the capabilities that we have in British Columbia, what we're building here in Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. And again, the opportunity to create scale in interoperability in a really exciting and emerging field. Jordan has been a great partner to work with on that team, and he's going to share today where, where we see the future and the opportunity for engineering biology here in Canada. And again, presentation will be about 20 minutes. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A section on the, uh, on the Zoom webinar so that we can capture the questions and provide answers either in real time or more importantly, if we have to follow up with some more detailed information, we will follow up with each of the, uh, for all the participants, answers to the questions during the meeting. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jordan. And again, Jordan, thank you for agreeing to participate in our, our webinar series and uh, take it away. Okay, Steve, thanks very much. And uh, I appreciate the uh, the chance to speak here. You know, I was joking um, when we were getting ready before the session here. Hopefully we can come in person in Saskatchewan sometime. I've been to Saskatoon and Regina four or five times in my life, always in December and January, which is uh, it's a beautiful place, but it's uh, it's chilly in those months. So it, it, it is different in July. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard it's uh, beautiful there right now as well. So um, something to look forward to post pandemic, I think. Um, okay, so I just pulled my slides up. Hopefully those are showing up. Okay, they're perfect, sir. Perfect. Okay, well, I'll just jump right in. So um, again, thank you, uh, Steve and, and Gifts for organizing this uh, webinar series and giving us a chance to speak on, on our work here. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Canadian Engineering Biology Roadmap and our, and our kind of progress towards getting to that point. Um, and I'll start off, uh, I, I always wanna jump in, I think um, and anyone that's really interested in the science and the technology, we wanna jump right into why is this super exciting and, and very cool and, and what's happening. And I wanted to start here with admittedly a, an incomplete list of Canadian innovation priorities. And so I kind of took these mostly from the most recent federal budget and also some of the, the large investments that have been made by the federal government um, over the past little while and broke them up into two categories. So. First is around the kind of uh, opportunity or problem focused areas, I guess you can call it. And on the right is, is really focused on technology. And so uh, the left, you can, you can see here things like vaccines. We have a biomanufacturing strategy, obviously very focused on, on vaccines in light of the, the pandemic. We're trying to address climate change, aerospace, um, uh, in the agriculture space here, obviously being uh, the, one of the world's top protein providers is a big priority and uh, signal through the, the investment in PIC and the supercluster there. So all of these areas on the left have uh, received significant funding either, either through carve out through the strategic innovation fund or other funding sources. And on the right um, are some technology areas that the governments recognize that we need national strategy. And so we were uh, glad to see genomics uh, highlighted in the recent federal budget and, and our, our work with Genome Canada on the Pan-Canadian Genomics Strategy. Um, Quantum was announced recently as a, uh, I think a seven year strategy and significant funding um, being put into that and artificial intelligence um, also uh, renewed as a, as a national focus area. And so all of these areas uh, make sense, I think, um, and, and you look on the, the technology focus areas on the right, I think these are all exciting because they're super disruptive and you can kind of draw lines uh, from, from each of these areas to the problem or opportunities on the left-hand side. And so I, I guess the, the, the central thesis of 
what we've been trying to advance and, and, and in this talk is really, we feel that engineering biology deserves to, to have a national strategy and, and focus uh, due to the disruptive nature and due to the fact that we can address a lot of those problems and opportunities on the left. So I'm going to frame um, the, the rest of the talk around some of these areas and, and try to shed some light on why we think engineering biology is uh, very exciting and then some of our work towards uh, uh, getting a roadmap started up here too. So Steve uh, kind of talked about this already and, and uh, really uh, I, I see you see it in, uh, in the previous talks around how engineering biology is really changing the game and, and, uh, and especially driving a, a bio revolution and, and a biomanufacturing revolution. And I think uh, we, we all know well that humans have been using biology for many, many years. So, you know, we discovered in antiquity, um, you know, if you leave crushed grapes out that we know now wild yeast will make ethanol out of that and we get wine and that's a, a nice drink for a lot of people. Um, fast forwarding to the industrial revolution, we took that same process. So exposing yeast to sugar to make ethanol. And now we kind of massively industrialize that. And that's how we make uh, biofuel by, by isolating that and blending into, uh, into gasoline. And I think what's really exciting about uh, engineering biology is that we can now completely redesign bioprocesses and we can leverage AI to, to design those pathways and cells, and we can use automation and, and all the stuff that, um, that, that Steve, you're working on with your platform at GIFS to, to speed up how quickly we can, we can engineer biology. And it opens up so many opportunities for what we can make um, in, in the world. So it, I, I wanted to highlight just the, the state of engineering biology and kind of three relatively simple examples. Um, and all of these areas really, I think, at first glance, don't seem to have anything to do with each other, right? So you have uh, mRNA vaccines from, from Pfizer and, and other companies, um, really uh, amazing innovation and, and doing a lot of good and, and helping to hopefully end this pandemic soon. In the center, you have the Impossible Burger, and there that's a, that's a plant-based burger, and they have a, a, a flavoring additive heme uh, protein that they produce through fermentation. And on the right, you have a, a dress from Stella McCartney made of silk, but rather than coming from, from silkworms, it's coming from bolt threads and they produce silk through fermentation. So this is something that we, we encounter when you talk about this is that you know, this one platform can impact all of these areas and, and how are they connected? And so we thought about, a lot about how to communicate that. And I'm gonna take a crack on the next slide to see how we, we think about it and, and why um, this is really a platform technology and what makes it exciting. And I think this is the kind of language um, that, that some companies are, are starting to use, like Ginkgo Bioworks, is that it's, it's programmable biomanufacturing. So you look at kind of, uh, and I apologize to the really technical folks on the call, because this might seem an oversimplification to you, but you have you know, your cell in, in the, the top here. And basically now, when we look at what product do we want to make, we can program that through DNA. So if we look at, well, we want to be able to ultimately make the spike protein, or in this case, the, the, the RNA that encodes for the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. We can design that, uh, put that DNA into our cell and, and amplify and, and eventually end up with our, with our vaccine active ingredient. If we wanna go and then target a heme protein for our, our plant-based burger application, all we're doing there really is changing the sequence of that DNA that we're putting into the cell to now encode for, for heme that gives that kind of meaty uh, flavor um, and, and, uh, and makes the burger kind of more appealing to consumers. And, and lastly, uh, switching again to, to a silk protein sequence, instead, we can now produce silk through, through the, the same um, cell-based process and, and isolate and spin that into fibers and make dresses. And that's what Bolt Threads is doing. And so you can see, um, trying to tie back to, to some of the priority areas, this is one platform and a common technology that is really helping on the, the biomanufacturing issue around vaccines. It can help us to uh, improve our uh, value of protein um, that we can uh, manufacture here and grow in Canada and help to achieve uh, net zero as well. And so on the net zero, I, I wanna spend just a second, I'm a chemist, I haven't actually used uh, uh, shown a reaction schematic in, in many years now, but I wanted to do this just to make sure I could still do it and, and try to illustrate how engineering biology can help achieve net zero. So this is not the only application uh, area here, but just to show where materials come from. So if you think about nylon on the top here, used in automotive and in textiles, all kinds of applications, 
you know, it starts with oil. So all the carbon in nylon um, that we use is coming from oil. So obviously that results in, in GHG emissions. But to go from oil and basically go through all of these chemical steps, they're very high uh, temperature, very high pressure. And that basically causes a release of CO2. We're going to burn fossil fuels to power these processes here to get to, to our ultimate uh, nylon uh, fiber. Um, Genomatica has a really exciting innovation where now they can take a corn sugar, but this can be kind of any uh, agriculture source sugar, um, and through an engineered yeast can in one step go directly to, this is a dipic acid, this is one of the monomers in nylon, and uh, it's not completely um, net zero in, in terms of uh, emissions, but much, much lower energy. This is done at you know 30 degrees Celsius instead of 250, 300 degrees Celsius. And you can get there in one step and then, uh, and then produce nylon just like you have uh, you, you would uh, with petroleum-based nylon. So they estimate Genomatica about 60 to 70 percent reduction in emissions. And we can replicate this across all kinds of materials that come from petroleum. Um, I want to highlight too that, that engineering biology already is is really big business, and this is uh, uh, some data from Bioeconomy Capital in in the U.S. And uh, I think on the bottom here, everyone when um, a, a lot of our engagements, you talk and people recognize biologics is huge, and and that's really important. Um, definitely at Gifts and and probably for a lot of the audience knows that crops is huge business as well. Um, but I, I wanted to zoom in on the uh, the industrial biotech applications here too, and you see all the types of things that we can make, whether it's uh, food and feed ingredients, so amino acids for livestock feed, as an example, or biochemicals, including the kind of really uh, flashy stuff like silk, but also the kind of more mundane chemicals that are just part of our everyday life. And this is really big business already. So lots of um, uh, money and, and economic growth coming just from, from engineering biology already today. Um, for those that are following the, the engineering biology field, Ginkgo Bioworks is one of the kind of first pure symbio companies really focused on, on making uh, biology easier to engineer is their kind of slogan. And they just went public last week and really comparing themselves to Amazon Web, so kind of cloud computing, and they can be the cloud computing for, for biology. I think uh, in, in Canada, we want to uh, maybe not outsource all that to Ginkgo, but um, I think there, that's, that's how you can think of um, you know, where, where this field is going, you're starting to see some of these, what, what could be tech giants like Google and Amazon being created in engineering biology today. And I think this uh, uh, slide and, and the allusion to the, the um, bio-revolution report from McKinsey's been made, and it's kind of a theme for the webinar, but I have to emphasize again here, just the massive opportunity and really looking at uh, two to $4 trillion in, in economic value being created over the next 10 to 20 years. And half of that application coming outside of health, which is really exciting, I think, for the agriculture community, energy and materials, all these areas, as, as well as health, of course. So tons of opportunity and really impacting a lot of sectors um, in Canada and around the world. And I think a key thing to consider is this might seem a little bit far off right now if we're talking 2030, 2040, but you know, Ginkgo Bioworks uh, is about a 15 year old company. Um, and so all of these things take time to, to reach scale and, and to grow. And so really, I, I think it's the investments that are being made today that are going to be driving that economic growth we're going to see in, in 2030 and 2040. And I wanted to pull out some numbers just to benchmark engineering biology to some other areas. So this is a 2020 venture capital investment. So this excludes uh, public funding into research, but um, artificial intelligence, obviously huge amount of money. I forgot the billion there, that's $27.8 billion total. Um, and Canada has a national strategy on that, uh, funded at almost 444 million for, for good reason, obviously there, this is uh, transcending all kinds of sectors. Quantum venture capital, um, 680 million in, in 2020. And we have a national strategy and there's obviously tons of very, um, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but lots of really exciting stuff happening in quantum as well. And this is gonna keep growing. And you look at engineering biology and this is uh, $7.8 billion uh, invested last year. And I think in the first quarter of 2020, it was already uh, 4.6 billion. So uh, again, a, a rapidly accelerating. And we don't have a, a national strategy 
here. And so I think that's something to, to consider really is looking at where, where is investment going and, and where's the world going and, and trying to make sure that we have a, a coherent plan for how we can build that in Canada as well. And so here I've highlighted a few kind of um, major Canadian VC and in industry investments into engineering biology. And a key thing um, in, in all of these is that these are Canadian companies or Canadian funds that are investing in companies outside of Canada. And this isn't meant as a criticism of them. I think all of these groups, you know, they have a responsibility to their shareholders or, or to whoever's funding them, Canada Pension Plan, to a lot of us on the call. Um, and they're looking for where is that business opportunity. And so here you see Suncor investing in lands a jet. They make jet fuel from, from waste carbon emissions. Perfect Day is a, um, a dairy uh, product made, made from fermentation processes. Canada Pension Plan was the lead investor in that Series C round. Arcturn invested in a cell ag company, Mosa Meats. Teachers and Motif, which is a food ingredients and, and cell ag company um, that spun out of Ginkgo. And Lou Lemon, um, uh, based in, in Vancouver, made their first equity investment ever into Genomatica around that bio nylon process that I broke down in an earlier slide. So. I'd argue here we we have interest in the private sector and in investing in, in investors in technologies, and they're really going to where is there a pipeline of companies and where are companies reaching the scale that that these investors want to invest? And and unfortunately, right now it's not um, mostly in Canada. And I think part of that is you know when we look at other countries and and what they've done. Um, the U.S. and the U.K. are, are great benchmarks, I think, um, in, in the U.S. I think uh, uh, Steve Evans presented at the, the last webinar and was really a, a big part, I think still is a very big part of, uh, of uh, Sinberg and, and EBRC and, and getting Biomade going. But uh, down there, really, um, you know, part of that process is uh, the EBRC developing research roadmaps and say, where can they really have competitive advantage? Where is the field going? And then moving that into Biomade, which is now uh, the most recent manufacturing USA Institute. So you see all kinds of other examples around 3D printing and regenerative medicine, this kind of thing. And what's interesting, I think, is Biomade is focused entirely on engineering biology applications outside of health. So all around ag, industrial biotech. And that's a near uh, $200 million project um, when you um, factor in the industry uh, and state co-investment with the federal government. The UK has also been really on top of this in, in developing national roadmaps um, and strategies for synthetic biology and has seen a, a really good output, I think, of, of private investment and company creation coming out of their public funding into research. And you see that kind of climbing up exponentially there. And so I think in, in Canada, especially in Canada, we can always look to the US being so close to it and say, look what the Americans are doing. We want, we, you know, we need to follow. And, and I think there's there's always good good things there. But I, I think you know, the US and, and the UK arguably too are really large companies and, and have a you know a lot of money to invest in these types of things. And I think Australia is an interesting comparison for us to look at as well. So, you know, um, similar in many ways to our country and, and natural resource based, um, uh, lots of agriculture. Um, and there they've, they've published a, a national synthetic biology roadmap, and they're estimating by 2040, 27 billion in annual revenue, 44,000 jobs created, and their top opportunity was um, identified as food and agriculture. So I think this is really um, what we'd love to see in Canada is what's that number for Canada and, uh, and, and really zoom in on, on what, we can, um, what we can get out of this and, and how we should go in, in uh, reaping those benefits. So Steve uh, talked about this a little bit and, uh, and really happy to have him on, on this committee and you'll recognize a, a few other faces of, uh, of future speakers in this series too, Vincent Martin and, and Isha. Um, and and we, in 2019, we created this National Engineering Biology Steering Committee and we really wanted to have diversity from across Canada. So we try to have representation, like Steve said, from, from right across, um, from coast to coast and also um, sector representation. So we have people with expertise in, in health and stem cells. We have agriculture expertise. We have industrial biotechnology expertise. We try to have a trainee perspective here as well. And, and this group is really, um, we've been working with them to try to, to steer a course and you know, where should Canada go in, in engineering biology and work towards that, that national roadmap. So last fall, we published a, a white paper 
um, that really is a, a call to action for Canada. And if you haven't read it, I invite you to, to go and check it out. Um, and I won't read all of the, the items here, but really we tried to lay out the case for why this is you know, so important to Canada and try to identify some of the areas and, and considerations from industry partnership to the regulatory aspect that, that Steve mentioned uh, as well there and, and, uh, and all the, the pieces that we need for a national strategy and, and really highlighting international collaboration as, as critical for Canada, especially when we recognize a lot of countries are a little bit uh, farther ahead of us on, on this. And within the paper too, we highlighted three kind of key opportunities for Canada. And uh, the first, uh, this is in no particular order here, but the first is a circular bioeconomy and really how do we turn waste or low value products into high value products. And, and that really can contribute to our net zero climate change priority that the government's um, identified. Um, looking at protein biomanufacturing, so producing um, ingredients like heme that can be blended with plant-based foods or other ways of making food like cellular agriculture, um, really addressing our, our protein priority in Canada. And last, uh, on advanced biologics, so this really um, um, ties in with the, the biomanufacturing strategy that, that ICED has published and vaccines and antibodies and, and, and all of these advanced treatments that, uh, that Canada needs. And so we've now taken a, a deep dive um, or in the process of taking a deep dive um, with a, a subcommittee of our, our steering committee, uh, including Steve and, and looking them in, in, into cellular agriculture and trying to understand what's that opportunity for Canada and um, looking forward to, to Isha's talk um, when that's coming next in this webinar series as well. But we're doing this in partnership with Agriculture Canada and, and trying to do significant outreach and try to, to get feedback from across the country and, and different stakeholder groups and try to assemble that all up into a, a white paper that we're planning to publish this fall. Um, we'll also have a um, Canadian Science Policy Conference um, panel uh, to, to talk about this paper and, and dive into what that opportunity looks like for Canada. So stay tuned on that. That should be coming out in the not too distant future. And, and lastly, I, I got to put a plug in for our, our, our own event series here. We, we kind of uh, have continued to try to build the community and, and bring people together. And we've done our, our Canada Symbio conference series over the past several years and, and pivoted to virtual next year and uh, hoping to, to do this again in, in March 2022. And uh, who knows what the world will look like and whether we'll be able to come together in person or we'll, we'll continue to do this. But looking forward to, uh, to having that event as well. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, uh, Jordan, thank you so much. And um, first, a couple of things, I really appreciate you giving the, giving the overview. And in fact, you hit one of the questions that um, we didn't get a chance to answer in the very first session was what is the role of machine learning and artificial intelligence in, in engineering biology? So. Again, I your slide there hit the nail on the head in terms of the integration of, of that with the biology. I did like the, uh, the pathway to nylon diagram Go because it, is I, I'm, I am not a process chemist, I know that, but I do like to see the flow. And I think it's, it was extremely illustrative of how we can use uh, technologies to new technologies to make products in a more sustainable manner than we have in the past. And I thought that was, that was a terrific example. A um, couple of questions um, to, for us to maybe start with relates to the, um, one of the challenges with engineering biology has been defining, you know, what it is, where it fits um, in some ways, it, it, it integrates across, as you had in the, the picture of the biomaterials, the, the food space and, uh, and health, it hits across lots of business verticals. And in some ways that is a bit daunting for, for people, for funding agencies, for strategy development. Any thoughts on how we can, um, further simplify that message and 
build on the fact that it is actually, like you say, it's it's a uh, it's an enabling platform. How can we better position engineering biology for innovation? It's a really good question. I uh, and, and this is something we we think about and talk a lot about um, trying to explain how do we make this kind of make sense, right? Because you know, like I showed on that slide, the products are all completely different, right? And I think at a certain point, you know, when you get to late stage commercialization and it's going to market and so on, they have nothing to do with each other in, in many ways, right? Uh, you know, like the, 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 the market for plant-based burgers is a lot different than the market for vaccines and, and you know, apparel and, and so on. But I think that's something we've, we've thought about and tried to communicate is that, you know, when you're at that early technology development stage, your, your problems, you know, say as a, a company trying to produce a, a heme-like uh, flavoring, say for a, a plant-based burger, your challenges are almost more similar as a company to, uh, say, a pharmaceutical company that's trying to develop a, a biotechnology process for uh, an antibody or something like that, right? Because you're really focused on on that challenge of how do I, you know, like that path, that that design, build, test, learn cycle that that I showed. So, I think I think that's one thing is looking at, you know, how does this platform link up with common challenges that you know companies, academics, whomever is 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 coming up with the innovation has. I think too, just looking at um, at how disruptive this technology is in these different sectors and how it's recognized by the point I was trying to illustrate with investors is really that they they see that this is you know a big differentiator when you have this kind of technology behind your product. And I think I think that's something to to try to educate more and more. Is uh, I, I think the challenge there is people don't really know how nylon is made, for instance, right, or what goes into a uh, a plant-based burger or any of these things. So you can't, it's, it's very hard to say, this is how it's done now. And engineering biology makes it better because you're, you're educating across the whole spectrum of <laughs> the way things are and, and the way that this helps, you know, make it, make it better, cheaper, faster, whatever the, the advantage is. So, so. Yeah, I, I think those are, are great points. And, and what, you know, why does Canada need, why do we need a roadmap? And I've, I, you know, I got an opinion because you and I have talked about it, but why do we need a roadmap and why do we need to, to develop this strategy here at the, for Canada? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, two, two big points, I think. I think it's, it's, it's too important to feel and it's having too much impact on a lot of sectors that matter to Canada. So when you look at, um, this isn't targeting, you know, niche industries, it's, it's really impacting major sectors for Canada especially when you look at, um, you know, we haven't historically had a, a major pharmaceutical company here, but when you look at agriculture, food processing, food production, we have a lot, that's a massive part of the Canadian economy across the country, right? A lot of um, large companies uh, um, that, that rely on this, on the, the material side and, and, and chemical manufacturing is a, also quite a big part of our economy in, in multiple provinces. So I think from a, long-term kind of prosperity for, for Canada, I think this te these technologies are going to impact these sectors, are impacting these sectors. And so I think just from a, a defense standpoint, we need to, to be building this in. I think another reason for a, a national strategy and why not let it just kind of play out, right? And, and uh, I mean, people can apply, you know, as a, an academic, you can apply to the Tri-Council for funding as a company, you can look for, you know, different sources of funding as well. I think kind of the, the reason that you said is that this crosses over to all of these applications. It's 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 complicated to to really see how does this connect, right? And I think um, when it starts to cross over multiple, um, you know, ministries and agencies and government crosses over multiple uh, industry sectors, including kind of uh, you know biotech companies and innovation and more established traditional companies that don't have ex that expertise. I think. That's where you start to need a bit more of a coherent look at at, at how you do this. Um, so I think th these are two two reasons that resonate strongly with me, anyways, on on why we need this. Yeah, because in fact, there's a we have a question from one of the participants that um, because like we've just talked about Jordan, it spans so many silos. Was the word? use, but I like to think of verticals. <laughs> but the point is a good one from the question. It also spans, like you mentioned, industry, academia, government, 
regulatory yep. uh, uh, issues. How can how do you how do you feel we can best bring these together so that we're not creating redundancy? How do you see the roadmap to uh, being able to help bring ensure that we don't? The worst thing we can do is buy five of the same thing and none of the three things we actually needed with the first one we bought. So you wanna answer that question? And I apologize to the person that asked the question because I ad-libbed on it a little bit. <laughs> no, it's a very good question. Um, and, and I think you're, you, you are right. It, it, silos is a good word a lot, uh, you know, a lot a lot of the time to describe it and not in a negative way. It's not like people are trying to, you know, sh close themselves in and, and not interact. It's, um, it's just being aware even of the, the, the different applications. So I think of, um, you know, my, my, myself in grad school in the chemistry department, never heard about industrial biotechnology or synthetic biology or that you can produce, you know, some of the molecules I was trying to make through biotechnology, right? And, but there were probably people down the road, at, you know, at U of T that were doing that. I know there were. So uh, I think just that, I think, um, trying to make people aware of what are the opportunities for their skill set, right? And um, so some of those things don't require a lot of money either, I guess, right? It's just trying to raise awareness and, and create opportunities where someone that, you know, is working on, um, on, on I say, a technology or like a lot of people that are working on like fundamental biology of yeast, say, right? Some of these people went on to found Perfect Day or, or these types of companies because they saw, I know, how to, I know how to make and express proteins. Why don't we make that one, right? But it's not something that, say, uh, you know, in a in an academic hospital that you're going to come across. So I think that's one piece on the the roadmap is just trying to, you know, th there's there's ways we're trying to do it, like uh, like our conference and like this webinar series. But I think more intentional ways where can you have more multidisciplinary opportunities for trainees, say, right, to to do exchanges in labs and and work on different problems. Uh, and, and just raise their overall level of, of awareness there, I think um, is something that, that needs to be highlighted. I think too, something in Canada, I'm, I'm not trying to advocate, I don't think we're trying to advocate with this roadmap to say, you got to cart, you know, none of the funding that's out there right now is suitable. We got to carve out something entirely new and then here's a new silo, right? I think that's also the last thing that we really want to do. I think it's trying to look at where are those gaps, right? Where is it hard for, Someone you you talked about, uh, you know, equipment there. Where is it hard to say compete with other researchers on specific types of types of things? I think so. Trying to to find where are those things that you really do need focused focused um, support around, and and challenging people on where that focus support is needed too. You know, so if, if you know I need a, a you know a foundry or I need a larger bioreactor for my work or whatever. Is there overlap there, right? I know we've we've chatted about this, right? Is there overlap between uh, what I'm trying to do and someone maybe across the country in a different, entirely different vertical or silo, whatever you want to call it, right? So, trying to to facilitate that type of thing and and then be able to to create those partnerships and then go to existing funding sources like CFI, say. So, I think these are these are some of the ideas I think that um, a roadmap needs to bring out. So, really highlighting what are those key gaps and opportunities where we're not doing something and then how do we do it that isn't entirely just you know a bunch of money to support that i think we need to work with what, what's in the system already right and I, I think one of the other things for me that i think helps connect the verticals or silos is the concept of interoperability one of the things that your presentation did extremely well was it's not there's one opportunity and it's small this is a big, big opportunity for Canada. We cannot afford to be left behind. You know, the McKinsey report is two to four trillion dollars in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years of new economic value. So the, the space is, is huge. And the ability to create a network, as we've seen with the, you know, the issues related to COVID-19, is how do we connect and scale in a way to address the challenges that we don't even, that are not even on our radar. And one of the things that excites me with the, with the steering team, with Krishna, with Vincent, with, with, with Paul from uh, 
the Michael Smith labs and, and what we're trying to do here is that connectivity and interoperability to be able to scale what we do here to support industry and, and new offerings. And again, I think that the opportunity here is there's, there's, it's not a scarcity challenge. There's, and the, the way that we, the quickest way we kill the golden goose is if we all run off to our own corners and we don't work together to be able to create this. Uh, another question from, from, the, uh, from the participants today, and I think this is also a very good one. Um, you know, when, when making food is the nutritional value part, when is the nutritional value part of the process? And I, I've got an opinion on that, but since you're the speaker, Jordan, I'll let you start and then I'll, I'll jump in for that one too. Sure. So this is a, a tough question for me to answer first before you, I think, uh, given uh, your, your expertise. But I think if, if I'm understanding the question, it's really looking at um, these new types of, of, of ways of producing foods. And I think one thing to clarify for, for us around the cellular agriculture work is that I think sometimes in the public domain, you see it framed as an either or, right? This is bad. This is good. This is the last message that we want to put forward and, and the last thing that I think Canada should do. I think it's really looking at how do we you know, encourage new ways of making food? How do we strengthen existing ways of making food? And the, the Impossible Burger is a good example, I think, of, of that where um, you know, we, pea protein is the primary protein there. How do we produce you know, um, ingredients that can enhance the that, that that really is, I think, a flavor, a flavor profile. I don't think that's a, a nutrition goal there with that, really, right? So I think um, I, I defer to others that know more on the the plant based uh, protein side. But I think it, it is a consideration generally there. I think especially if we're looking at, at new ways to to enhance our food production system, nutrition has to be one of you know near the top of uh, of that list. It can't just be kind of uh, you know taste and, and consumer appeal. I would say there, but I'm, I'm definitely curious to get your take because I know you have a take on it and, uh, and lots of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, and I was, I was gonna, first of all, awesome answer, Jordan, but because again, when you think about the challenges that we face with, um, when we think about food security, we used to think about enough food. We just used to think about calories. And one of the challenges that we have is it has to be not just enough calories, but it has to be nutritionally balanced. So some of the things that we've been doing at GIFTS is supporting work on, bio, on fortification of lentils and you know, to address iron deficiency or other micronutrient deficiencies that can potentially come along. I think nutrition needs to be an integral part of the design of, of the making of food right out of the gate. And that idea of, of it has to taste good because you know what they say, you know, what's, what's good for you doesn't taste good, but then you don't eat it. So I think what we need to be thinking about is, yes, it has to taste good. It has to be appealing, but we have to design it from the food with nutrition front and center in mind. Um, in my career, I've had the opportunity to work to bring omega-9 oils, so naturally stable, non-hydrogenated oils to the marketplace that eliminate trans fats and saturated fats. So those are always things that are, are, are very important in, uh, in the, the, the development of food, especially for us at Gifts. It isn't just about production, it's gotta be also about the nutritional quality of those foods. And another question that came up from esteemed colleague who will remain nameless, but it's a great question. Is engineering biology on the radar screens for any of the five superclusters, perhaps a joint national initiative? What do you think, Jordan? Uh, it's, it's a good question. I, uh, I mean, I obviously can't speak for, for those groups, but we, we definitely engage with them on, on this topic. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I drew the, I showed the example of, uh, the different technologies there. And so you can definitely draw a line to, you know, Protein Industries Canada there on, on the protein. And, and I'm sure that this is on their radar. Um, I think on the advanced manufacturing 
supercluster in Ontario. I mean, our, we, this is a slogan too, I think that Ginkgo has, but you know, biology is the most advanced manufacturing technology in the world, basically, right? And so um, I, I think uh, that is something I would say that that's on, on their radar too. And, and it's an interesting idea, I think, and I was kind of uh, alluding to that around a roadmap, right? You can't go in and say, we just need an, you know, an, an entirely new thing created when there's a lot of capacity. So how do you tie that together? I think that's the, the opportunity and the challenge, but I think definitely there, there's an opportunity for tying into, to really, I, I probably most of the superclusters, I think uh, on, on this, um, in, in, including, ocean, you talked about Omega uh, oils as an example, right? So, right. so bringing in, um, uh, you know, ocean around that for, for fish feed or other uh, types of alternatives uh, there as well. So I think definitely something, um, that needs to be part of the, the road mapping process is to bring in major stakeholders in, in innovation, right? And I think those are superclusters are key key players there for sure. Yeah, and like the digital supercluster on the compute and artificial yep. intelligence side again, it, it's uh, it's a great question and it's not hard to connect the dots. And again, I wanted to say that you know we've found that. Uh, the protein industry supercluster have been tremendous supporters of innovation and building the ecosystem around plant-based proteins and processing. And again, this is Gifts has enjoyed a you know good conversations with with the team. Um, can you question from uh, one of Gifts International Science Advisory panelists members? Can Jordan, can you comment on Canada's ecosystem? And this would be the, the venture capital that would support companies to be successfully develop and stay here in Canada. And I'll let you start and then I can add a couple comments about what we're trying to do here in Western in in Canada through partnerships through gifts. Sure. So I, I think um, I'll comment on the, the capital in Canada. First, I think there and some of those examples I showed in, in our discussions with in, investors, it's there's definitely it's on the radar of, of investors here as a really exciting area. Some will focus on different areas, like some are you know um, healthcare focused, so they're interested in applications there. Some more on you know clean tech or or ag and so on. So I think they're um, definitely interest. A challenge already always in Canada, I think, is that really early stage capital. So pre seed seed funding, I think, is tricky. From Canadian investors, and something we've um, tried to do and, and piloted is how do we access capital, say in the U.S. And so um, we we piloted a program previously to send companies to uh, IndieBio in San Francisco. They can get uh, 250k U.S. there and, and access the kind of Silicon Valley network of of investors, especially at that seed stage. But then incentivize them to come back. So make sure that you know we can help find them an incubator space with labs. A little bit more funding to continue work here. So I think um, we need to look at, you know, with creative ways here. I think of how to to do that and and recognize maybe especially with COVID, um, you know, Canada isn't such a crazy place to build a company from a, a U.S. Uh, venture investor's perspective uh, now, where things are really decentralized there. So, but uh, I'm curious to, to learn on on your work here too, Steve. So 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 he I and I I know some of the companies that you've put through that program because. We've had a chance to meet them through the development of the engineering biology white paper and and oh before i forgot we'll post a link on our site to the white paper for those of you that haven't had a chance and i would echo jordan's comment encourage you to please read it and provide comments some of the things that we're trying to do here in in um at the global institute for food security is through partnerships with ag west bio the Food Development Center Innovation in Place is we've created a uh, Canadian not-for-profit called the Global Ag and Food Advancement Partnership. And it's obviously domain specific to ag and food because the ag and food vertical has some unique challenges versus the, um, you know, the tech, the pure technology plays and uh, even the for the pharmaceutical in industry and incubators don't really work in the ag and food sector because of timelines are longer. It's much more concierge level. So that that's an organization that's up and running now that is does two things. One is help companies that are looking to access the North American market from overseas, make soft landings here in Canada. 
and it also has it, we're also building out and closing an investment fund that will make you know a significant uh, larger investments versus the the incubator model where they're more modest and they move through as cohorts these are longer more substantial interactions to help focus on de-risking the the product and the technology through the innovation ecosystem so the the code name is gap g-a-a-p and uh that's something again like like jordan said we're all working to try to create an environment to catalyze new companies new jobs new products and services that are being offered to producers here in canada but also consumers in canada with access to the larger uh, north american market because we're right next door to a big big market with some really nice ad advantages of being here in canada another question um, related to innovative ideas in university labs and how can they be connected to speed up their commercialization and strengthen our leadership in this in this space uh, jordan do you want to tackle that one and sure i mean I, when, when when i think about the how to speed that up i think I think two ways kind of right one is is connecting up you know if you want to to take the technology through academia and, and ultimately license to a company I think that academic industry partnership model works works well I think and so trying to to connect in there and that's something that we've we've tried to do and, and is done through um, uh, uh, Genome Canada has a program called the gap as well it's spelled differently there but uh, to try to fund those larger partnerships and there's other funding sources I think too like uh, NSERC Alliance and so on but connecting into industry I think that maybe is obvious to the person asking the question but really testing is what you have of interest to to industry and to companies or not and the other I think is um, the startup path I think is becoming not easier necessarily but it's it, it is easier and more cost effective to start uh, at biotech engineering biology company today than it was say 20 years ago right I think it's not uh, like like Steve like you said different companies in different sectors have very different challenges, but I think looking at that model, and I think more and more investors, um, especially in the U.S., but but starting to grow in Canada too, I think are recognizing you can be a you know a graduate student or a postdoc with a great idea, and you can go start a company. Right? This is something that happened in in tech and software, where um, you know lots of you know young founders are, are are funded, and I think more and more this is a path I think that that students should consider as well if you've got a cool technology. Academia has a lot of advantages, but getting out of academia and uh, and really focusing on what's that commercial opportunity can be a really big advantage too for for speeding things up there. I think. And I I, I kind of think that I agree with you, and I think that the engineering biology platforms allow that design build test learn cycle to go so fast mm -hmm. to start to answer some of the questions, and you know it's not going to answer. What we can do at the lab bench is one thing, but that idea to get to a proof point is is much easier in this context and kind of like hacking your way to, exactly. uh, to is uh, I think really exciting and uh, it's a real opportunity I think as well. I think one of the things that is imperative to help with the with the translation is the connection with industry, attending conferences, engaging, participating in meetings because again listening and understanding what some of the challenges that industry faces you may have the solution so again that's a, another a key a key attribute so um again i want to thank um uh yes and we're uh and Jorg has validated that Amrus was started by grad students and postdocs. And uh, that's, that is right. And I think it's a really exciting opportunity for engineering biology here in Canada. And uh, one of the things that Steve Evans, our last uh, speaker, he was a big champion of was, uh, you know, Biogem and the opportunity to do stuff at high school students as well. So again, those are opportunities to, to really move move uh, the engagement. And I think that's the other thing that's ex I'm excited about engineering biology is the ability to, to engage more people in the science side of, of what we're trying to do. So with that, um, I wanna thank everybody for, for coming. Jordan, thank you so much for your presentation. And, and again, as um, 
for the questions and engagement from the participants. Um, I want to thank you for making time to join us this afternoon, this morning, or this evening, depending on where you are. And uh, we will be sharing this video with you all. And as I mentioned, we'll put a link to the to the white paper because, uh, again, I want to thank Jordan and the team at Ontario Genomics for their leadership to bring together that diverse group. That's the, uh, you know, from government, from universities, from not-for-profits, and from the from the private sector together to begin the process of developing a strategy for Canada. Because I think as I, you could accuse me of drinking the Kool-Aid with Jordan, but I believe that this is strategic and very, very important. And very much like he's pointed out aligned with some strategic initiatives that are already being uh, funded by the federal government. And it's maybe a way for us to not have silos, but connections which would be really important for advancing science, technology, and innovation here in, in Canada. So with that, uh, again, I'll just, I'll close. And again, thank you, Jordan, for coming and participating in great presentation. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody at our next session. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks, Steve. Take care, everyone.